Welcome to our student privacy and COVID-19 training for state and local education practitioners. Our goal is to equip you to navigate privacy and security issues that are emerging as a result of distance learning amidst the global pandemic. We will cover four topics. First, we will discuss why it's important to protect student privacy. Second, we'll talk about federal and state legal requirements shaping privacy protection amidst COVID-19. Third, we'll discuss how to respond to the unique privacy concerns related to the shift to distance learning. We will close with additional resources to support student privacy protection efforts. Before diving into details, it is important to understand what we mean by privacy. Privacy is the idea that people should be able to control their information and that any entity authorized to use it does so in ways that respect individual autonomy. In the case of education, we are talking about protecting the privacy rights of students and their families. As you might be aware, schools have legal obligations to protect the privacy of their students. The good news is, these rules have not changed. Every local education agency has navigated them before. But privacy protection is about more than legal compliance. Data and technology can powerfully shape educational environments and learning outcomes in both helpful and harmful ways. Practitioners are ethically obligated to ensure that technology and data are used responsibly and not at the expense of student safety and well-being. When responding to issues of COVID-19 and student privacy, it is important to understand the risk you are trying to mitigate, especially because privacy and civil rights are often jeopardized in moments of crisis. As schools adapt to a distance learning model, it is critical that we protect students online to the same degree that we would protect them in person. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has created unique challenges for education systems, exacerbating risks to student privacy, which can take many forms. The headlines below illustrate a few ways students have been harmed through privacy breaches. To respond to these diverse challenges, privacy protection requires a thoughtful, multifaceted strategy centered on keeping students safe during this crisis. Now we're going to look at federal and state legal requirements for protecting student privacy that should inform current practices of using data and technology to support distance learning. First, it is important to understand which data require protection. Personally identifiable information, PII, an important legal concept with a central role in protecting students, refers to any information that can be used to identify a person, either directly or in combination with other information. Privacy legislation is most concerned with protecting PII, so you should be familiar with what constitutes PII. The data points that compose an education record include students' names, contact information, birthdays and places of birth, as well as individual grades or feedback and or student health records are likely PII. Additionally, other forms of information like videos, photos, and even written documents that refer to an individual student can be considered PII. It is especially important to recognize PII elements that may be collected and shared as a result of the pandemic. For example, if a student tests positive for COVID-19, that information is considered PII and should be protected as such. Similarly, if an educator captures video conferencing screenshots or videos that feature individual students, that media is also considered PII. This list is not exhaustive, so when protecting PII, you should think critically about specific circumstances to ensure you are not inadvertently disclosing information that can be linked to specific students. Student privacy protection is subject to both federal and state laws, which must all be considered to ensure legal compliance. At the federal level, the primary law that governs student privacy is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, also known as FERPA. FERPA is a comprehensive student privacy law with three main features relevant to student privacy protection and distance learning. First, FERPA is most concerned about protecting students' PII. If information cannot be linked to an individual student, FERPA would not apply. Second, FERPA generally prohibits sharing student data without parental consent, but it does have limited exceptions. Third, for state and local practitioners, an important exception to note is the school official exception. It allows local education agencies, or LEAs, to designate third parties, which can include vendors providing distance learning services as school officials, and share PII without parental consent. 
Before third parties can be designated school officials, they must have legitimate educational interest in having access to the data, perform a service that the LEA would otherwise provide, and allow the LEA to maintain direct control of that student data. In addition to federal legislation, the majority of states have enacted their own set of student privacy laws. As state and local practitioners, you should understand how your state's privacy laws apply and what you need to do to comply. Now that we've talked about what student privacy means, how it impacts students, and how it is addressed in federal and state laws, we can discuss the steps you should take to protect student privacy during COVID-19. Data and technology resources are critical in allowing states and LEAs to continue providing education services. You should take six critical steps to ensure ongoing privacy protections. Utilize existing data governance structures, train educators, use appropriate agreements, secure video conferences, create a data deletion plan, and consider the impact of using data and technology on privacy and equity. To start, practitioners should utilize existing data governance structures. Data governance refers to the people, processes, and structures in place for managing data and privacy overall. Good data governance is especially important during COVID-19 because it ensures that even when decisions are being made quickly in response to coronavirus constraints, privacy-minded practitioners can weigh in on discussions and inform thoughtful decision-making. Student privacy is not a new function for state and local practitioners, so your organization likely has pre-established policies and processes to guide decisions regarding privacy. To ensure that any established governance structures for protecting student data are integrated into your COVID-19 response, you should first, rely on staff that have worked on student privacy issues in the past. You likely have individuals and working groups who have past privacy experience, as well as valuable institutional knowledge that can help navigate these issues. Next, ensure that privacy considerations are integrated into any new governance structures or work groups that you create to oversee distance learning efforts. It is possible that these are not led by data and technology staff, but it is important that privacy-minded staff members are part of these conversations to ensure that students are being protected during decision making. Lastly, utilize existing agreements when implementing new tools or expanding the usage of existing ones. We will cover this in greater detail later. The second step for state and local practitioners is to train and proactively communicate with educators. Educators need to know how to use new technologies in ways that support student learning while protecting their privacy and keeping them safe. Most educators do not have a background in data privacy or security, and the majority of data breaches result from human error. The good news is that privacy training can help reduce the chances of mistakes. Privacy training can help teachers understand basic technological and legal aspects of privacy and security protection, empowering them to make informed decisions. Without background knowledge, educators risk jeopardizing student data or even creating a legal obligation for an educational institution by agreeing to terms of service that have not undergone adequate vetting. How can you provide effective training to educators? Start by creating or repurposing existing training materials to educate teachers and school administrators on their role in protecting student privacy. See this training module's resource list for more information. In particular, you should offer explicit support around video conferencing if that is being used, including which tools to use and what security practices are needed to ensure safety. Video conferencing is a major source of privacy and security issues causing harm to students during COVID-19, as discussed later in this training. Consequently, this issue requires particular caution and care. It is also important to remind educators that they should not take screenshots and post pictures or videos of their classes if they include images of students. Educators should exercise serious caution when recording classes that show individual students, since these recordings are considered PII and could introduce privacy risks if they are inappropriately reposted or shared. Last, you should provide support around selecting online learning tools applications, and systems, as educators typically lack the expertise needed to evaluate privacy policies and practices. In particular, you should have centralized vetting and review processes that evaluate tools' privacy and security protections, as well as their alignment with instructional practices. The third step that you should take is to ensure that the appropriate agreements and contracts are in place with all vendors that are collecting students' PII. 
These agreements establish how you will use a vendor's services and how that vendor will handle student data. Agreements and contracts have always been an important element of protecting student privacy. By putting these policies in writing, you can ensure that both technology vendors and education institutions understand acceptable and unacceptable management and use of student data. Last, agreements with vendors help ensure that you retain control over student data, which is a requirement under FERPA when exercising the school official exception. We recommend a few strategies for making sure you have appropriate agreements and contracts in place. First, when drafting a new agreement, look to existing contracts with established vendors to see how they can be repurposed for new vendors, rather than drafting a new contract from scratch. Even when using free services, state and local practitioners must still satisfy student privacy legal obligations. Additionally, putting in place agreements when using products or services that were not designed for educational purposes, like video conferencing or social media, is particularly important as they may not have policies in place that are appropriate for handling student data. When you are reviewing agreements and contracts, pay special attention to the secondary uses of student data, as well as the data deletion practices if you do not plan to use those services after schools reopen. The only legal use of student data by third parties is to serve educational purposes, and data deletion practices are also bound by legal and ethical obligations, which we will discuss later. When reviewing these agreements, one tip is to look for keywords that might indicate data practices that do not comply with student privacy laws or best practices. The fourth step to protecting privacy is to secure your video conferencing tools. Using video conferencing and recording classes to deliver instructions or communicate with students is likely a new experience. So it is important to put in place the right legal and technical requirements, especially as these platforms were likely not designed for educational purposes. Privacy breaches related to video conferencing tools have dominated headlines related to distance learning and have resulted in direct harm to students by exposing them to inappropriate content. Another video conferencing related issue is student bullying and harassment. This can take the form of disruptive screen sharing, which detracts from teacher content, abusive student behavior in chat rooms, and offensive handles chosen for usernames, all of which create an unsafe learning environment. In order to mitigate some of the risks that come with video conferencing tools, follow technical and legal best practices to help virtual classrooms remain a safe, productive educational space. First, treat video conferencing as if personally identifiable information is being shared, which means that you need to ensure that you have the appropriate agreements in place and that you maintain direct control of all related data. Next, prevent unwanted participants from joining virtual meetings Set a password or ensure that the link to the meeting is long and difficult to guess. Similarly, adjust your configurations to restrict other users from sharing their own screens, recording video conferencing sessions without consent, managing participants, or commenting in public or in user-to-user -user chat boxes. This should align with the plan for managing when students are speaking, how they are presenting, and any screen sharing needs. Finally, when possible, Pre-assign participant screen names prior to the start of the video calls and set up a process to approve participants before they can join the meeting. These practices can mitigate offensive behavior during video conferences. We've already touched on data deletion plans when discussing agreements and contracts, but we will address them more fully here. Data deletion plans are important because they can determine the length of time a student's data is stored before it is deleted, whether internally, within an education system, or by third parties. Deletion plans also articulate the techniques that will be used to systematically delete the data. Data deletion plans help minimize risk of keeping data for too long and without a clear purpose. Not only are third parties legally required to delete data after it is no longer needed, but data that is kept indefinitely can pose a threat to students and their families as old data can be used out of context in ways that harm or limit opportunity for students. The issue of data deletion is particularly important during COVID-19 since schools may be using services and products that they do not intend to use once school campuses reopen. Another reason data deletion is especially important during COVID-19 is because schools may be using vendors that are less familiar with education context and that may not have data deletion policies that are appropriate for student data. It is important to set expectations about data deletion at the outset so vendors' expectations align with legal requirements, as well as schools' and families' expectations regarding data storage. 
When creating a data deletion plan for tools that have been deployed to support distance learning, start by making a list that documents all third parties that are collecting student data during the COVID-19 outbreak. Next, set up a process to regularly update that list as new products get implemented. This list will serve as an inventory you can reference when deleting data at a later date to ensure thorough deletion. The second component of a comprehensive data deletion plan is to use agreements and contracts to set data deletion expectations with vendors about their timeline and practices for deleting data. Lastly, thorough data deletion is technically complex, so when data is deleted, make sure to use technical best practices to ensure that data deleted is unrecoverable. The last step in protecting student privacy during COVID-19 is to do what is core to the education system which is pay special attention to equity. This will manifest itself in a couple of ways. First, many schools and students face disparities in access to devices and reliable internet. This issue, which is referred to as the digital divide or the homework gap, existed long before this pandemic. However, the emergence of COVID-19 and emphasis on education technology is exacerbating these inequities as schools move online. Second, COVID-19 may also exacerbate equity issues related to meeting the needs of all students in a remote learning context. In particular, educators and practitioners should carefully consider the unique needs of students with disabilities and English language learners who are particularly vulnerable when relying on technologies that may not have been designed to meet their needs. Any effective equity mitigation must begin with understanding and assessment. In the case of technology access, take stock of your students' current access to devices and reliable internet. This will help you evaluate what kind of strategies and interventions you may want to employ to ensure that they are able to participate in online learning. Strategies include providing educational laptops or tablets to students who lack device access and providing mobile hotspots or even deploying park buses mounted with Wi-Fi capabilities in areas with underserved connectivity access. Bear in mind, that each of these initiatives all require privacy considerations and should be implemented with privacy best practices in mind. When considering students' learning needs, pay special attention to students with disabilities and English language learners. Ensure that distance learning tools have the needed accessibility features to accommodate students with disabilities. When teaching English language learners, pay special attention to languages that are offered in various teaching tools and learning applications. Those are the six steps that state and local practitioners should take to protect student privacy during COVID-19, while leveraging the benefits of data and technology to provide education to each and every student. In conclusion, thank you so much for participating in this training. We hope that this has been a helpful overview of why student privacy is so important even during a pandemic, how federal and state legal compliance factors in, and most importantly, what you can do to protect student privacy during COVID-19. As we mentioned before, privacy is not new in education, so there are existing resources that can and should support schools during this crisis. In the following slides, we have compiled those resources that offer additional support on many of the topics and recommended actions we covered. Please send us feedback on how we can improve this training and feel free to reach out with additional questions. Our contact information is also included at the end of this training. We thank you again for your time and for the work you are doing on behalf of students and their families.